start. Um, we're going to introduce ourselves. I'm a senior judge, and my name is Rochelle Ferris, and um, I spent 35 years in consulting for software, large software firms like Oracle, SAP, and Kronos. I retired a few years ago, um, went back to school, and now I'm a chaplain at a local healthcare agency. I'm Barney Rosenberg. I'm also a senior judge for this session, and uh, I've I like to tell people that I'm a recovering lawyer. <laughs> uh, practiced law, started out as a white collar criminal defense lawyer, oh. and retired a couple of years ago as the global vice president for ethics and business conduct for a British company in the aerospace business. I'm Steve Rhodes, former investment banker. I teach, I have a consulting business. We do international brokering deals, um, as well as government affairs and so on. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all of your background. Okay, so whenever you're ready, I will hit the start button. If when we if we get close to the 25 minutes, which we're going to talk about, I'll give you a two-minute heads up. Right. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. you are taking a fictional business identity and assigning a fictional business identity to the judges. Please make sure everyone knows who you are before you begin. You'll have 25 minutes to describe the legal, financial, and ethical dimensions of the problem and to recommend a solution that passes muster on all three counts. During this time, teams will be interrupted. Uninterrupted, sorry. <laughs> when you are finished, the judges will ask you questions for 10 to 15 minutes. During Q&A, both you and the judges stay in character. And after Q&A, we'll give you feedback outside the role of your play. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> you do. Um, good morning, judges. Today, we are here to present to you our case on building a greener future through sustainable infrastructure in Sao Paulo and Brazil. Now, to meet the team. My name is Catherine Beegee, and I am the Industry Specialist. My name is Cameron Lubin, and I'm the Market Analyst. I'm Ryan Holling, Strategy Specialist. And I'm Shreya Van Kat, the Finance Strategy Analyst. And all together, we are Arbery Consulting, here to help you build a greener future. And so now, first taking a look at our table of contents. First, we'd like to dive into a little bit of history, into the history of Sao Paulo, and talk about some of the issues that are currently pressing their city today. Then we would like to talk about some innovative solutions to these issues and be able to address these issues in a creative way. And then we would like to talk about our financials and how to truly invest in the communities here and talk about the implications on your company and how you, this is financially feasible but also financially profitable. Lastly, we would like to talk about our implementation timeline and also talk about how we can measure impact in our three key stakeholders. And so now going into a little bit of background on our case. So our executive summary, we pinpoint our issues and how we would like to address these issues. And so for a little bit of background of Sao Paulo, they're currently facing an air pollution crisis, which is mostly caused by traffic and vehicular emissions. This is due to the fact that many of the workers inside of the city actually are commuting from the, the outskirts of the city, where affordable housing is much more prevalent. And so with this, drivers are seeing long commute times towards the inside of cities, spending a lot on the cost of fuel, and spending a lot of time in these congested areas. And so we would like to find a way to sustainably develop Sao Paulo, Brazil through affordable housing and sustainable infrastructure. And so in, in addition to environmental deterioration, we also see a great social divide between those members, those citizens of Brazil. And so included within that, we see a Gini coefficient of 42.5, which is very high, and which indicates a negative um, uh, imbalance of wealth. And we also see that 20% of Brazil is actually living in poverty. Lastly, we like to talk about economic stagnation, where Brazil is experiencing very slow GDP growth, especially in comparison to the other BRICS countries, and is expected to have a lower GDP growth going into the future. We also see a very high unemployment rate in Brazil. We hope to address all three of these issues through our solution of building a greener future through a sponsored concession public-private partnership between your company and the government of Brazil. 
Through this, we hope to provide value to all three key stakeholders, including the people of Sao Paulo, your company, and the federal government. And so now talking about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Essentially, the UN nations came together to form these 17 goals that encompass political, economic, and environmental factors. And in essence, in our case, we would like to talk mostly about Goal 11, which is sustainable cities and communities. Although this is the direct primary benefit from our solution, we also see a myriad of secondary effects, including increased health quality, reduced inequalities, and decent work and economic growth. And so now, we'll, I'll pass it on to my colleague to talk about why Sao Paulo. So, why Sao Paulo? This is the traffic you all, as CEOs, experienced last night, going home from work. So, we targeted South Hall because of three metrics. One, the photo I just showed you all, as you are all familiar with, the traffic gridlock. It's reported that average citizens spend 52 hours of their lives locked up in traffic. That can be greatly decreased. In addition, there are 400 total helicopters that are flying around right now, taking 700 trips a day. This makes it more than New York and Tokyo combined. Next, we are stepping into major air pollution with 2.5 units of, meticu uh, of uh, particulate matter going into the lungs, such as smoke, smog, and dust. This can be very detrimental to health, especially in the lungs. Lastly, the increased revenue that has been gained in three years, $6 billion, with public-private partnerships. This leads us to our key takeaway. You, as a board, know that you can invest heavily into your city. And so, with this plan, we hope to encourage you to take where you have been founded to further develop. With your 84 years of experience, long history and track record of awards from innovation of engineering, and then also in safety regulations, you have done projects from thermal plants to ports to bridges. However, there is a sector you have not truly tapped into that we believe that you can increase profits and help Sao Paulo become more sustainable. For the stakeholder analysis, we identified three target groups of many individuals that fall into these rankings. First, we have the citizens of Sao Paulo. These are the commuters that the city will be having go through the roads. These individuals will increase later on in the presentation their, their time that it takes to get from their home into the city where they work. That time will be decreased. In addition, you have, you have the future tenants of the individuals who will be building these, these buildings. These individuals include all of the citizens that will be renting from the buildings that will be built later explained in the plan. The next stakeholder that's key is the Brazilian government. This is the Brazilian treasury, the main individual who functions over the Ministry of Infrastructure and then acting as a landlord. Next, and those points will be touched on later in the presentation. Next, you have the company itself, your employees. You have the, your investors, which will be increasing over time as you grow your company within this project that will later on be touched on in multiple years. So to expand upon the stakeholder analysis, we also want to address corporate social responsibility. So our plan of building a greener future addresses um, a lot of these initiatives that are encapsulated in CSR, and they also address values mentioned in your aim, mission, vision, and core values. And to summarize as a whole, it's just that they really emphasize the importance of sustainable development, of economic growth, and wanting to be a leader in this industry. And on top of that, our project proposal to you guys of uh, building a greener future also targets the true bottom line, which is people, product, and profit, which will, people, planet, profit, sorry, which will be expanded upon more in the upcoming slides. When we were looking for the proper company to partner with for this project, three came to the forefront. OEC, Gary Gabo, and Camargo Correa. OEC is Brazil's largest construction company and has a wealth of experience in this type of project. However, last year, at the end of 2022, they had an incredibly 
uh, controversial scandal in which they had fraudulent contracts with some of their partners and uh, their parent company is also facing bankruptcy. This type of ethical uh, inconsideration immediately disqualifies them from any sort of eligibility for this project. And moving on to Gira's Gaba. They have experience in both infrastructure and residential buildings, which would make them a good fit for this project. Additionally, their integrated management system allows for enhanced government oversight, which is key in a project like this. However, they are a much, mar much more moderately sized company and may lack the scale needed in order to take on a project of this magnitude. And that's where we came to Camargo Correa. Not only are you one of the most innovative companies in Brazil and the winner of multiple innovation awards, you have a high focus on sustainability and work conditions, which are both key for this project being completed successfully. And additionally, you have experience in the urban construction projects on the scale that is necessary to complete this project in a timely manner. So, Camargo Correa combines the innovation, sustainability, and experience needed to successfully complete this project in a way that none of your competitors can. Moving on to the innovate section of our slides, we start with the strategic recommendation. Our first key point is the goal of the project. Our objective is to utilize PPP funds and government partnerships to create uh, these affordable housing to ease the stress on Sao Paulo's infrastructure. We do this by offering, uh, by repurposing abandoned property and minimizing urban sprawl. Rather than using new undeveloped land to build these projects, we'll be repurposing lots that are now being used for nothing. There are over 550 abandoned buildings in Sao Paulo, and we can make much better use of those than what is currently being done. And finally, we'll be providing diverse options for a wide variety of lifestyles. This will make our, our apartments very attractive for a wide variety of people and ensure this project is a success. The first benefit is that Camargo Correa will be building both housing and a legacy. This is key because Camargo Correa can now enter and leave their mark on Sao Paulo, the city they call home. And additionally, we'll be able to centralize Sao Paulo, minimizing the downsides we saw earlier with long commutes, helicopter travel, and emissions by making it so that people will have less distance to travel to work, to their jobs, to services, anything that they need will be much closer to them and reduce the need for any sort of travel. And additionally, we'll be both directly and indirectly improving the infrastructure of Sao Paulo. Through this project, we will be both easing the stress on infrastructure by reducing the amount of commuters daily. We'll also be directly improving the infrastructure in the areas surrounding our complexes. So our timeline comes in five phases. In year one, we start with identifying. We'll be finding suitable locations out of the 550 previously mentioned locations. We can be able to narrow this down to a number of properties that we have the space needed to construct our buildings and are located in convenient areas. Next, we move to the acquire phase, where we will set prizes and acquire the necessary materials. One of the most common factors that result in the delays of construction project is a lack of materials and issues acquiring them. By ensuring we have the necessary suppliers and funds, we can ensure that there will be minimal delays, if any, when we move to the next phase, construction. Construction begins and should be completed within two years. The average apartment complex takes about 13 months to build, so this is a very generous timeline that will allow for more proper development of our complexes and ensuring that they are the highest quality possible. And further, we move to maintain. At this point, we'll be having tenants in our buildings and your company will be collecting the passive income of rent payments and maintaining the buildings as the years go on. And further, we could look to expand. If this project is a success, we could find other countries and cities that are in need of a similar project and attempt to propose the same thing. So now we're going to talk more about the types of development partnerships that the Brazilian government offers. They offer two, um, sponsor concession and administrative concession. So under sponsor concession, it's really about where the funds are coming from. So in sponsor concession, the funds are coming from both the government and the people that are using the services that are being provided. So in this case, it's the apartment building, so it would come from the tenants. And in administrative concession, it's just the government that's providing the funding because they're the ones that are directly benefiting from the product being created. And later on, like in a few slides, we'll tell you what our actual recommendation is for which one of these two PPP models that you should propose to the government. So first, let's look at some, let's look at the cost benefit analysis of PPPs. So some of the benefits are increased efficiency, increased economic growth, increased competition and innovation, and there's also an increase in quality of service as well as a decrease in risk, which is due to the shared risk between the public entity and the private entity. But some of the drawbacks are that Profits are very based on risk, competition, and the complexity of the project. Contracts are long-term, complicated, and inflexible. 
and there's also higher cost due to government oversight. But the oversight is there to provide more reliable and higher quality service that aligns perfectly with your values as it is. So the PPP process in Brazil is unique. It's not like any of the other countries that I've ever seen. And so the first step is to submit a formal request, which is going to be reviewed by the Brazilian government. And then once they've approved the request, they will then send out a newspaper like article um, talking about their intention to undertake this specific project. And then that will open up to, that will allow like, other companies to come with their own proposal and also offer a bid. And once those bids have been submitted, the, gov the government and obviously the companies and themselves will do some research on their end to determine the feasibility of their project. And once the feasibility has determined, those bids that are, determined, that are deemed feasible will be allowed to participate in the competitive bidding, which is when they get to like, announce more of the plans. It's not, it's not a purely financial thing, it's more about the actual content of your plan and what's going on in it. And so that's why the bidder with the best proposal wins, not the cheapest plan, but the best proposal will win. And we believe that the proposal we're providing, building a new future, is the best one. And from that step, then the PPP plan discussions can begin. So that's where you can negotiate the contract with the government. So that brings us to telling you what our recommendation is for which PPP structure you should go to the government. And we chose sponsored concession because of the different streams of revenue that you'll receive. You won't just see the payments for the term of the contract, but you'll see them for a time after that, which is through the rent payments from the tenants and also the businesses that will be operating there. So when taking a look at the public-private partnerships, because we are working, we are advising you to work with a separate entity, which is the Brazilian government, we must talk about intellectual property and who retains the ownership of each individual asset. And so taking a look at our two approaches, which with sponsored concession and administrative concession, with, regarding sponsored concession, because there are multiple um, financiers of this project, including the government, investors, and the tenants, um, we can see that there can be a mixed ownership of assets here. Whereas in regards to administrative concession, because the government is the one primarily providing the funding, in this case the government would retain ownership of most of the intellectual property and the assets. And so taking a look at our specific case with our sponsored concession approach, we see that Camargo Carrera will retain ownership of the asset through its construction and through its lifetime. However, the government, as they are the ones providing the affordable housing to the citizens of Sao Paulo, will be the ones maintaining the property. Moving to our example building plan, we look to Singapore's highly successful subsidized housing program as an example of what is possible. Not only are their designs simple and replicable, they're also high quality and very attractive for people to live in. They become such a success in Singapore that many have often been flipped for higher prices than they're purchased for. And additionally, many of the designs contain a void deck, which is essentially an empty floor on the bottom that can be used for shops, uh, doctor's offices, kindergarten, uh, other type of daycare. Any sort of service can be contained under here, which will further centralize Sao Paulo and make it so that people will have less need to commute and, as we mentioned, take helicopters or long car rides. And finally, as mentioned, we'll be offering a variety of floor plans for families, couples, solo living alike. Again, furthering the attractiveness of our projects and ensuring that there's something for everybody. As you can see, we have five different floor plans that are used in Singapore very often. Two room, three room, four room, five room, and three gen. What this does is make it so that we have an option for any type of lifestyle and ensure that we can effectively appeal to as many consumers as possible and get people out of the outskirts of the city and into the center. Now we'll talk more about the financing of this project. So this is the income statement um, from Building a Green Future, our, for the project that we're proposing. And all of the numbers are in Brazilian reals. And it's stated as is, there's no conversion needed. Um, and so we decided we would um, show you guys, or show you the income statement from the consolidated income statement from 2019, so you can see a comparison to what our project will, is projected to bring in. So as you can see, in 2019, there was a net loss, but if you see 10 years from then in 2029, there's a projected increase in revenue from our project. And the numbers that we have a slides in the appendix detailing more of like where the numbers are coming from. But to summarize, the other operating expenses at the moment are from ad passing expense, which will be detailed further on our slides. And the SGNA costs are from hiring more employees that are needed in order to execute the project. And the payment in the first year is 20% of what the government will be contributing to the total cost, but we're going to see it expanded across 
all six years of the project. And then in 2029, the increased revenue that we're seeing is from both the, government, the last government payment and also the revenue from the tenants and the businesses that are staying there. So the public private project that we're, that we're talking about is sponsored concession. And Brazil's Ministry of Infrastructure's annual budget is 19 billion reals, which is kind, which is the entity that would be funding the project for us, for you guys. And the total project cost is 15 billion reals, but we didn't want to put that total cost on the government. So we also we split it up across the six years and had the government contribute roughly 12 billion reals and investors contribute uh, 3 billion reals. And once again, this would be distributed across all six years of the project. And improving infrastructure is the first step in this process of reducing pollution, and it's definitely an investment worth making. And it works this way because once the infrastructure is improved, the commute time of, this, of the citizens of Sao Paulo that are on the outskirts of the city will be greatly reduced because now they're living in the city, so they no longer have to stay to those, that long traffic. And so once that is fixed, then the roads can be redesigned to be more efficient, because as we saw earlier in the slides, how bad the traffic is, and part of it is because of the poorly designed roads and how they were just built to fix a problem in the moment without thinking further the effects that it would have. And then that would reduce the reliance on helicopters being used daily, which is a major contributor to the pollution that we see in Sao Paulo, which is obviously a big detriment to the health of all of the citizens of Sao Paulo. This leads us to the final stage of the plan. Moving on. First, we have mass communication through radio and TV. This will be able to help commuters going into work know to turn left, to turn right, avoid these traffic jams that will occur as we go on and demolish buildings, rebuild buildings, and through all of those stages. So staying in touch with radio stations is key, and that's where some of the expenses come from. In addition, we have print. Print in Sao Paulo is massive. It's well known, and it's also the way all generations will be able to understand what's going on in their city Moving on to the final points is through social media. The highest amount of users use Instagram, then Facebook, then TikTok. All of these platforms will be advertised on about different buildings, making individuals aware and making all generations understand what's going on in their city. Here we wanted to present a SWOT analysis as we dove into the material. First, strengths. You have decreased time that it takes to work decreased time it takes for individuals and commuters to get to work. That is because you will have individuals living into the houses that will be built. In addition, you also have weaknesses. Successful funding is key, and this is a weakness. However, we hope to note that through past years of $6 billion being invested, in addition with the PPP that we have expanded upon for you, that this government opportunity will not be missed and that this threat of not working with our company will not be a huge weakness. Finally, opportunities. There's opportunities for growth, for your employees not only to work but also to hire those who are not working, to reduce the unemployment rate and also for citizens and tenants to live in a low income housing situation. That's individuals working for your company in addition to commuters who are spending 30, 45 minutes who can now live right in the center and still have cost-effective savings. Finally, threats. Different competitors, but as noted before, we hope to mitigate that as you are the most qualified individual company to do this project. And then finally, yes, government taxes and different policies can be made within the six plus years that are going on. However, with the communication from the government, we hope that this threat is reduced overall throughout the six years. And so while addressing the issues, being able to pinpoint a couple of key stakeholders, uh, deploying out financials and having an implementation timeline, we would like to measure the tangible impacts of all of our various efforts, broken down into our three key stakeholders. Our first one being the citizens of Sao Paulo. We would like to take in consider into consideration the amount of people relocated closer to the center of the city and also take into consideration their new commute time to work. Next, we would like to take into consideration you guys as a company and take a look at the increased revenue streams you would, you would um, realize from taking on this new public-private partnership in addition to taking on multiple new projects 
both within the timeline of this project and beyond. Finally, we would like to take a look at the federal government as a stakeholder and ultimately increase the GDP as we've experienced economic stagnation as the country of Brazil by, and in addition to that, um, uh, reduce the amount of infrastructure spending um, due to the lesser reliance on existing infrastructure. And then, About two minutes. And then to conclude, after analyzing the background information of Sao Paulo and understanding the current situation of what's going on, we have been able to pinpoint that affordable housing and infrastructure are some of the key things that we must address when looking to reduce pollution. And then our key questions are how can we um, reasonably reduce pollution through infrastructure and how do we measure these impacts. And then once again, we believe that our solution of building a greener future through a, through, um, a sponsored concession, a public-private partnership, addresses all three key of our stakeholders and will create positive value in the short term and in the long run. Once again, we are Arvory Consulting, here to help you build a greener future, and we thank you all so much for your time. Thank you. I'm sure some of my colleagues have questions. I have a question. <laughs> yeah. Could somebody explain what, is it Gini, G-I-N-I is? Yes, the Gini, the, the Gini coefficient. Okay, what is that? So essentially the Gini coefficient measures the distribution of wealth amongst a, a specific population. And so essentially it's taking a look at how linear a regression might be. And so in some countries they might have a higher concentration of a middle class, or in other countries you might see the, a very small middle class and higher concentrations of an upper class and a lower class. And so that's what we see more of in Brazil. And so um, that would lead to a higher Gini coefficient, which is um, seen upon us more unequal distribution of wealth. And is that a government initiative? Uh, the Gini coefficient is what is used internationally to measure okay. um, the wealth distribution. And then um, the government um, in the past has kind of pulled back on public spending and um, has not had exactly equal distribution of public resources, which has contributed to this um, expansion of the Gini coefficient. And so um, through this um, proposal to you, all, um, we hope to reduce that Gini coefficient and make the whole distribution um, a little bit more equal. That's an excellent answer. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Steve? Um, <clears throat> currently, who owns these vacant buildings of your time? That's a great question. There are actually about 70. Most of them are kind of either owned by the government already as they've been condemned or um, otherwise foreclosed on by the government. Uh, and there's 70 of them that are right now housing homeless um, people that are being owned by kind of homeless affordable housing rights activists. So those buildings would probably be off limits for now, but I think they would be obviously in support of the initiative because they are in, they are the ones protesting for exactly what we're bringing to Sao Paulo. So those are the kinds of ones we know about, but most of them would either be kind of miscellaneous owners or government owned. So they're non performing currently. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> would the government be responsible for um, eminent domain and taking over the properties for construction? Yeah, in the cases where that would be necessary, of course, we would need to pay for uh, the, the acquirement of the lots or the buildings that would be taken over. Um, and this is also something that we've been considering in our, in our cost of our plan. So it kind of works out to be about you know, what, we, what we have. It shouldn't be a major expense in those situations. Mm -hmm. So if we build these buildings, mm -hmm. obviously, uh, who would own the building once it's constructed? Would um, we own it or would the government own it? Yes, yeah, so that's part of our PPP plan where we make sure that uh, the, the company retains ownership of the building, which has to do with the intellectual property that we mentioned as well. Like, retaining ownership is very important. Like, the company is retaining ownership, but the government is just going to be the one operating because they're the ones that provide the affordable housing, but the ownership is still going to be retained by the company. The rent, would we establish the rent or is the government? The government would establish the rent because it's an affordable housing program. Yes, but we uh, would receive we a portion of it. Yes, but we would be the ones establishing the rent on the, on the void deck for the business, because keep in mind that this is still like in the center of the city, which is prime real estate, and these are businesses that have the money to be able to afford the prices the, of being able to... Uh, the businesses? Yeah, on the first one, that's what we mentioned in our presentation. Yeah, we want to go to the, the design plan. The void deck. The void deck allowing individuals like daycare services. So oh, okay, that, but that's the, fir the first floor. Yes. Right. The first this is a mixed-use development. Yes. yes. Exactly. But I'm, what I'm concerned about is who's going to, 
Will we have enough rents to service the debt? Yes. Yeah. Can you look at the financial I noticed the first year there was a deficit. Well, that's, that's actually, that's not of our plan. That was us comparing what was prior, that was 2019. Comparing 2019 to what we're seeing now, which, yeah, let's look at it in USD, so it's in a, well, like that we call it. But, like, so the 2019 is from what the company already has. That's not from our project. Our project is bringing in a revenue. Which year? All years, 2024 to 2029, and it'll continue on past it. But this is just, like, the scope of what we have in the project right now, the contract, but. And the, the revenue comes from rents? Yes. The first, the first five years, well, years one to five, no, it comes from the government paying. But once the building is complete, which it will be in year six, then we're also seeing the last of the government payments in 2029. But portion of the revenue is coming from the rents, at least from this project. My last question. That's <laughs> one. Um, so, what portion of the rent would the occupant pay, or is that? A graduate is it means tested in some way? Um, oh, we actually have this calculator. I so we can look at it here for how much we put it as under the revenue from the tenants. So we have it as the average cost of rent being three hundred twenty dollars a month, which it makes sense for affordable housing. And then we had that Camargo Correa, the company, would be retaining a sixty percent of the rent that's coming from just the tenants that are like. The, from the affordable housing tenants, but obviously that's something that can be negotiated more in the contract. I was just like the standard that we thought made sense. Um, but if you look at the revenue from sorry, or even the businesses, you can see that it's a lot more because we can charge these businesses more for the first floor, and that would be like a big chunk of where the payments would be coming from. So all these apartments in this building are going to be contributing less than the first floor. In aggregate, um, we we don't have that exactly broken down, but we do know that the negotiating power that we do have with these corporations will be a lot higher, given that um, the purpose of those first floors would be more for commercial use rather than for um, a more social initiative such as affordable housing. Um, but we do believe that both will bring in um, steady streams of revenue um, that would be helpful for um, the corporation. This is, I swear this is my life. <laughs> no problem. Um, is there a formula that the government uses to subsidize? The, you, you, you talked about different sizes of the apartments. Does the government have a set amount that they pay for each type of apartment? I'm, so I'm concerned about debt service here. Yeah, you no know, problem. We so got to go out and borrow money to build these things. So, I don't think we're borrowing the money in these days. So, yeah, so the company um, is actually receiving the revenue from the government. The government is essentially um, sponsoring uh, this project and essentially utilizing Camaro Carrera as the means to build these projects. And so um, through um, providing them the funds, which we see in our top line of the revenue, um, that's what constructs, that's what helps contribute to the capital expenditures of the company to create these um, real estate properties. And then, um, because of the high initial cost of constructing um, a unit or an apartment complex, uh, you can kind of offset that by collecting steam. Well done. <laughs> well, well done. Thank you. <laughs> Good question, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think my, my question is going to kind of build on that. Would um, you introduce yourself? Oh, just sure, sorry. Yeah, sorry, it's a few minutes late. I'm um, Ingrid Green, um, and I work here um, at LNU, and my specialty is business ethics and international business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and but yeah, let's go back to the financial model for a second. Mm -hmm. If you could, could you just explain the the cost of service? Because um, I feel like we've kind of breezed over that. Yeah. So it's only showing up in 2027 and 2028. Yeah. So, yes. what is so that would be the demolition cost and the construction cost because those are the two years. If you remember the timeline, those are the two years where construction is actually happening. So I thought it made the most sense to expense it there when we're actually building rather than expense it earlier. Okay. But once again, like I guess the way a company chooses to expense things is truly up to themselves. But um, that was just was the way that made the most sense for us. It showed it exactly when it's happening. Okay, got it. Okay, and can you go back to it? Uh, I just want to see like the amount. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, it seemed like accurate. Uh, maybe 
um, I'm, I have a construction background, so I always think that we all underestimate these things, um, especially compared to the revenue. So that kind of brings up my second question, is about um, the culture of Brazil, because I didn't hear so much talk about it. I heard a little bit about the three-generation homes and things like that, but the biggest thing when I think of Brazil, right, is the corruption, right? So do you have a plan to, to make sure that this project is rolled out um, with um, the least amount of um, cost um, bled from the project? That's actually a perfect question. That was, one thing, that was one thing we covered in our company comparison, is that Camargo Correa is one of the only major construction companies in Brazil without a major corruption scandal at the moment. So when you looked at OEC, they were Brazil's largest construction firm, but then they had a scandal last year where they uh, had fraudulent contracts, and now their parent company is going bankrupt as a result. So Camargo Correa is one of the most reputable and ethical companies in Brazil, which is obviously, as you mentioned, in Brazil it is a risk. But we did as much as we could to find the best company to um, fulfill the need here. It's very difficult to do, but um, we, we, we think we found the best option. We also, so on the ethical front, yeah. I've got all these people that you're going to move into the inner city. And first of all, there's more than one inner city in Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. And what happens to their old residents and the owners of those buildings? Yeah. So touching on that base, the whole goal that we're presenting to you today is to further reduce the emission rate. That is the sustainability goal that we focused on with developing the city. And so yes, there will be buildings that are 30, 45 minutes away that will lose tenants. However, that will decrease the overall emission rate. And then with that being said, that those properties can then list for less, they can list for more, depending on who's willing to live out there. When you begin to centralize all the citizens into a walkable distance to work, to stores, you allow individuals who want to then begin living outside to begin to pick up those houses and then live and expand and do projects elsewhere. Additionally, um, it's important to remember that part of our plan was that these infrastructure changes are the first step. Ultimately, we want the roads to be redesigned as well to make them more efficient. And so when the roads become more efficient, those houses on the outskirts become a lot more lucrative to those who don't want to be in the center, like I like mentioned. So there, there's still a market for those houses. They will still be lived in. People will still live there. It might just take time for them to readjust to it, but they, they will still exist. They will still have their place. Because there are people who don't want to live in the city, but still like want to be close to some home. And the final consideration is just lifestyle. Um, some individuals, some families will have jobs that are closer to the city center. And so for them, it would be most logical to move closer into the city to reduce that time of commute and to reduce the um, amount of money they have to spend on that commute as well. And so um, depending on each individual family, they might choose to move closer outside of the city um, due to personal lifestyle choices, or some might choose the alternative to move closer to the inside of the city. Um, and with this, we enable that. In the past, there just hasn't been enough affordable housing towards the inside of the city, which is why everyone is so far out. And so um, through this project, we hope to provide the optionality. In addition, you also have a large homeless population in the city, but also throughout the scattered rural areas where individuals are coming to work from. So with the affordable housing, that decreases the amount of individuals living on the outskirts and in spirits of the city, allowing for working opportunities with Camaro to end up, Camaro and Carrera, to, to work and then to take on a job that may just be more manual labor, but it will allow the unemployment rate to decrease overall. In address to your question, all those factors at a micro, macro economy will be influenced over six years, 10 years, and as both my colleagues mentioned, the road redesign and then emission rates lower. Okay. Anybody else have any more questions? It's deep. Uh, <laughs> Steve, feel free. We'll take more financial. Steve, no, yeah. Steve. Yeah. Steve. Yes. For your answer yeah. questions, we yes. have to hear them. Like a lot of time will come. So we'd yeah. love to hear any so. more questions you might have. I'm scared. <laughs> I'm scared. I'm scared of you guys. You guys are smart. <laughs> um, how many buildings? You said there were eight buildings, right? Yes, that's how many we... units are you talking about? That is a great oh, question. I have it it's through. Through. We have it. We thought of everything. We thought through we the questions. So you yeah, we again modeled this after um, Singapore, and their units on average have about 38 to 40 uh, units per floor, and our buildings will be about 20 stories. Yes. So that would be. 
And so with a little bit of market sizing, with 40 units per floor on average for these buildings, and around... You said 800 um, units? Per building, correct. Multiplied by the eight buildings we would foresee within the two years. Yeah. Down. And another thing to, that we, when we, when we found from research is that uh, Brazil has a cap of the height of the building to be like maximum 40 floors, so there's always room to make them taller if necessary, but we thought 20 was like a good amount to at least start off with since it's a new project. And that was touched on within the timeline, the 10 years plus implementation, those are expansion avenues we can always go through. Okay. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> Take a deep breath. Thank you all so much for your time yeah, thank you. and for all and your questions. They're very insightful. If I could jump in for a minute. Uh, right after college, I moved to Brazil. Uh -huh. Actually, lived and worked um, in Brazil as a Peace Corps volunteer. Cool. Uh, bilingual in Portuguese. Wow. Oh, wow. That's really cool. um, I just, there's a saying that Brazil is the land of the future and always will be. That's how severe the challenges are. They're never going to make it. Um, and Brazilian, you hear Brazilians say the same thing. Sao Paulo is out of control. Always has been. Well, I don't know, 15 million people living in the city. And then you talk about suburbs, and it's not so. And I just wonder how. I thought, when you showed the cars at the beginning, I thought that was LA. <laughs> it looked like the 405 freeway. Yeah, exactly. um, but it's sometimes more than twice that. So I, I, I just sort of wondered how are you going to get water, sewer, electricity into these new buildings? So it's a big challenge. But you did a nice job presenting it. I mean, it's complex. Like complex. Does that mean you know what like our consulting group's name means? Arbery? The tree. Yeah, correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was actually one of the reasons why we uh, chose Camargo Correa because they also have infrastructure experience, so they'd be able to develop kind of water lines and things necessary to make an apartment building livable and attractive. With, with the company overview, with bridges, with everything they've done. Yeah. And they they're based that. in Sao Paulo, so it's their city, so they can more like, a, oh, like we have to fix our city. So and just kind of like, apropos of nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I worked, lived and worked outside Brasilia. Oh. And I started a housing co op. Oh, wow. To build low cost housing for the people who built Brazilia. Wow. That's really interesting. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> deep in the last century. <laughs> okay. I have no experience with construction or Brazil. But, but I was a project manager for a long time, and I was wondering if you guys considered doing a pilot before you presented mm -hmm. to this company so you might have some experience or, or a success. Our, if we may, uh, our pilot was the Singapore model. How that was the pilot that they took, and then we were using their plan with with the docking buildings to, to further expand it. Yeah, Singapore's like affordable housing has been like an unbelievable success. I really recommend you guys look into it because it was fascinating researching it. Like a lot of their complexes are huge, and they kind of do the thing where they replace the space that they're taking. So the top of their buildings will have like a rooftop garden or a sports field for children. And as mentioned, the void deck was what I found really interesting, is that they have that bottom floor available for childcare, for healthcare, for stores, for anything you could put down there. I thought it was just amazing looking at that and how effective it's been in Singapore. And we thought that it could really apply well to South Holland. So um, another thing is, some of your, your slides are, especially financials, are necessarily complex. But like the summary slide, I I might suggest maybe making it a little less mm -hmm. complex. But what I, really impressed me is how you guys memorized all of this. <laughs> 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 that was quite a challenge, I'm impressed. Sharia, you had great responses to the questions I asked you, very oh, quick. Thank you. And then Catherine, I'm, I am impressed with how you held your ground with him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was a challenge. <laughs> no, I mean, your, your questions were very direct and, and I'm not saying you were rude, but she really, <laughs> <laughs> good. She, she really Whoa. politely but held her ground and answered the questions. Well, not to be d too direct. <laughs> um, I, I was in an investment bank and you guys talked about the government involvement. Uh, I would suggest that you incorporate local government uh, because they're going to do the financing of the infrastructure. 
uh, and you would use the government to subsidize the rents. Just a thought. We did a lot of work out in uh, uh, Riverside and San Bernardino build, building developments, not, not building developments, financing, and we sold the bonds for these uh, local governments. So you might want to have that to No, that wasn't too direct. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your feedback. No, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I think it's something we didn't really consider because it's like Brazil's capital city, so we thought like kind of the national and local government were hand in hand, but I guess that was definitely an oversight. I appreciate that. Not an oversight. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so I thought, yeah, it was very smooth. You guys are very confident and knew your material. Um, I say, I say thank you for pushing them because um, I... Um, I didn't want to be too direct. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was good. It was good, it was good right? Because it was helpful for me because, um, yeah, because I, I teach here at LMU and um, sometimes I think we're too nice. So, um, <laughs> I have to say, so I think, uh, <laughs> no, really, I think it's not a good thing. Questions are lovely, thank you. Yeah, it was good in the real world, and especially. I'm going to cry. Well, I'd like to expand more on it, so I like to. Right. So, we did all the research, we love expanding on it, that's what we're here for. Yeah. We're here to talk about it. Right, and, in, and right in Brazil, right, it's a tough world, so um, it'll be necessary to, to toughen up, right, sometimes. So, I can't, just one last question is how did you choose this? So it started with Trey and I actually. Yeah. Uh, on a personal note, my girlfriend's going to Brazil over the summer. And so I was like, is there anything as a boyfriend I could research? And so I introduced, like, let's look into Brazil. And then Trey and I, we talked on, wow, the emissions, the carbon dioxide, all of that. Let's address it. There's, and then we found the layers of uh, the building projects. And so it kind of like dove down and then we presented what we did to do. Yeah, like when we decided we want to do the pollution in Sao Paulo, we were like, okay, what's causing the pollution? What's the root of it? Because a lot of times, in a lot of different cities, you know, we see pollution for different reasons. Like sometimes it's just purely vehicle emissions. And then they say, yes, it's vehicle emissions, but why is it so? Why are people taking helicopters to get to work daily? That's not that's not feasible. Doesn't make sense. Like that's a, that's like a ridiculous amount of pollution being released. So we realized it was an infrastructure problem, which is why we're like, okay, so we should target infrastructure. Let's get construction companies, and that's kind of how we. It was, yeah, it was literally just picking around, finding details, going into the Singapore's housing model, kind of go on itself. Yeah. They find a way to also like to do it. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, have you done your other presentations? No, I do those tomorrow. This is our first one. Good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, nice to meet you. Thank you for your time. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Where in Brazil is she going? She's going to there. She's going. Sao Paulo? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> as a boyfriend, I wanted to learn as much as I could. Tell her don't, not to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Conquer the world. You know, hundred years ago, yeah, it was an yeah. I uh, worked with the ambassador of the Thank you so much. And, uh, your insights. Yeah, Brazil is very well so so That probably what's caused some of the congestion. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, you guys done good. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.